Welcome to Dan's Talks. Today's guest on the talk is uh, Peter Walsh, who is a uh, writer and a lecturer and is giving a lecture with accompaniment and song about the uh, uh, wreckage of a ship that uh, came ashore here one winter years and years ago. Well, I believe it's pronounced the Circassian. And uh, I wanted I wanted you to tell us about it and how it was, especially about how it related to the the local community who became involved in it when it grounded or just off Watermill, I think it was. Is that correct? No, actually, Bridgehampton, Ocean Road in Bridgehampton. And this is one of the great tragedies, probably the greatest tragedy of family members dying on Long Island in its entire history, um, because you had dying uh, at the tragedy, you had 10 Shinnecock Indians, you had 12 British uh, sailors, four uh, engineers or salvages from New York City at the time, and one Irish stowaway, uh, John McDermott. Uh, but it, what, what the preamble to this, of course, is you have 20 years of a, of a ship with the most ironic stories and bad luck and bad jow. It was an iron ship in 1876. By the way, 1876 was an incredible year in America. It was a turning point. You know, we were becoming an industrial power in the real sense of it. You know, we had all the benefits of the American Civil War, uh, making us creative industrial, uh, industrially. And uh, the music, it was an incredible year for classical music. The music being sung out here in Bridgehampton, the, the biggest song in sheet music was My Grandfather's Clock. The train had just arrived, which meant also the telegraph. 1876 is when there were 40 boarding houses in Bridgehampton. That's that's what started all the New Yorkers coming out here, slapping oh. uh, their wallets out and starting to rent uh, houses. It was 1876 that started the whole game, really, and the train. Uh, well, this, so, back, how, how did it happen? Um, well, back to the ship. Or how December? Did, yeah, it, it was December. The ship got stranded on a sandbar. And it, overnight, it was seen by the lifesavers of the Bridgehampton Station, the lifesavers of the United States lifesavers. And uh, their ancestors still live here. I mean, the, the, the people, the Ludlows, the Cooks, the Halseys, these are the lifesavers. They're, these are their names. So they literally save the ship courageously. They go out in the middle of a storm. And they broke eight oars in all the going back and forth. Now you're 350 yards offshore and going out in terrible waves. These guys can't swim. Um, they're, they're in a boat. The life-saving boat they had was an old one. The new one they were supposed to have was at the Philadelphia exhibition going on, uh, the world exhibition, the first American world exhibition ever. And uh, they had a life-saving station there in Philadelphia. And they said, oh, let's get the new boat from Bridgehampton and we'll we shell that in Philadelphia. However, my theory is having the old boat was better because they were used to it. They understood it. It was heavier. It was harder to use. But if they had the new boat, they would have had a, probably trouble getting through the waves because it was a lot lighter. So these men go out there. They make seven trips. Now, each trip they bring back, there were 49 people. Of those 49 people, 11 had just been saved a week before from the Heath Park. The Circassian literally was coming past, sees the ship going down named the Heath Park, which was carrying American slate from New Jersey over to uh, London. And uh, they tried everything, dumping the slate. They get saved by the Circassian. Hallelujah. Two days later, the ship sees another ship. It's a schooner. And it's a uh, pilot ship from the Sandy Hook, New York pilots, who in their business was the pilot and captain ships into New York Harbor. So they would sail out in these incredible, uh, fast, uh, large ships, uh, sailing vessels. By the way, they were the first, uh, the first winner of the New York uh, Yachting Club trophy that London uh, uh, challenged us to, or we challenged them to, was by a New York City pilot. That's how good they were as sailors. Uh, they were incredible. So he's on board. His name is Captain Sullivan. So you have Captain Smith from the Heath Park, Captain Sullivan, and you have Captain Richard Williams, a Welshman, 
who was the captain of the Circassian. Three captains on the ship at the same time. And I have to say, they obeyed the rules of the sea. Sullivan says, I'm not going to take off of the ship until I know where I am. The compass is not working. They had gone through severe storms for an entire month. So the binnacle and compass was out of whack. They can't see anything off the land because the weather is snowy. It's, it's some of the worst weather in the history of, of uh, Long Island was that year. Uh, it, it was continuous snow, it was storms uh, coming over here from Liverpool. The ship had a rugged passage. So you have, you have all, all these things going on at once, but you have the ship now, it's, it strands on the sand. It gets saved, 49 people. Uh, Sullivan didn't take off the boat because he couldn't see a landmark. So Williams was still in control. They all come ashore. Then they hire salvages from New York City, a, a, a company called Coastal Wrecking Company. These guys were pirates. Salvages were like having pirates. Um, you, you know, their, their history was coming from the wreckers that used to entice ships to crash on shore from, you know, the 15 and 1600s. But the, the, now they're wrecking. They're engineers. Twice before, the Circassian had been stranded, once up in, in Squaw, New Jersey, and once up in Sable Island, up off Newfoundland. The captain and the company that saved it both times is Coastal Wrecking Company, the same guys who are coming out now to salvage it on Long Island. I mean, this is irony. In a 20-year history, the boat is salvaged three times. So All what? what what is it that they're, they're going to do is take off the freight? Is that what they're going to do? And then Exactly. Smoke? It's all industrial freight from uh, England. You have very large stones that are used for scouring. Um, it's it's uh, asbestos was on, I think. Yeah, you had, but it's all industrial type things that are used in industry to clean machinery. Uh, there's some rags, uh, probably a, a, about a thousand pounds of rags on it. But that's what it is. And this is, don't forget, the engines have been taken out of this iron ship, three-masted iron ship, 280 feet long. Um, it's 280, that's 20, that's uh, 20 feet short of a football field. At that time, that's an incredible size. It was the largest ship ever built in Belfast in 1857. So uh, this is an incredible happening going on. But the heroics of the Maycox Lifesavers will soon get forgotten. They will never talk about giving them awards or medals, and they certainly deserved it because of what will happen in, in a very short time, in about 10 days. And when that storm comes along, Captain Lewis is now the captain of the ship. Captain Williams is on it, but Lewis, as the salvager, is now captain in hand. He says, oh, there's a storm coming. Great, because we're on the bar. The storm's going to float us off the bar. However, they had only unloaded two ends of the ship, which possibly was a mistake. Instead of unloading from the middle, they unloaded the end and it became like an anvil being banged down on a sandbar. So by the time the storm came and this guy thinks he's going to float over, you have 32 men on the ship. Who uh, were the Last we heard, they had all been taken off. So who was yep. brought? Well, who went back? Who went back on the ship was um, thirteen of the British sailors. One being the Irish stowaway. He probably was told he had to go back on. Uh, three of them were apprentices. By the way, there's another great story. Three young apprentices. They follow their captain. They stay. Fourteen British sailors left for New York and went back. They said, "This is bad luck. The ship is bad luck. It's bad jow." We're never going back on this ship. And they leave for New York uh, with the same people as Captain Smith and his 11 men from the Heath Park. So those guys are all gone. So these you have 12 of the British sailors. Two of them um, are um, African British you know, from the East Indies. The one's from Finland, one's from Italy. They're an interesting gathering. It's like a folk group, these guys. They're uh, sociological, uh, sociological people would say this is like a folk group. Oh, um, this, They're hired to take these the, the, the goods off. Is that correct? Right. That's right. Paid to do that. That's right. But they're short. They need more people. So what do they do? They go local. And the guy says, hey, you know who's great for this? Shinnecock natives. So they get 11 Shinnecock natives show up. 
and in uh, a very short time, one leaves for a whaling expedition uh, expedition up to the north. So there are 10 Shinnecock Indians. One guy from Southampton who basically worked um, on a farm, he jumps in and he's going to do it. So you have these 11. You have the engineers who are the salvages. By the way, the name of, of the uh, boat that came out to salvage was the Cyclops. I mean, just the name of it. Yeah, the Cyclops is coming. So the Cyclops is coming out, and these guys are pros. So they, these, guys, these guys were hired by the people who owned the boat, who were supposed to deliver the goods, and they've hired a salvage company, and they are the ones who hire all these people. And did they have someone on the site who was, like, overseeing this whole operation? Yes, there were two. Lewis on the ship, Captain Lewis, and then Captain Perrin, who was the captain on shore at the time. And they also had uh, hired a guy from Long Island, from Southampton, who would uh, be taking all the goods off the ship and bring it into New York. So these ships, you get into New York. Now, remember what I said. They've decided to unload from the ends. And that turns into uh, the mistake of it being banged and broken in two. And when that oh, happens... Boy. You have tw uh, 32 men in the ropes, and they're there like crows in a tree. If you, if you picture crows in a tree, and they could hear them yelling and screaming, you know, God help me. There were 25 men on shore. I have all the names what of the 25 the, people. What was, the, hmm? what was the weather going? Oh, when the ship absolutely ridiculous. They were trying to shoot uh, balls to the ship, you know, to see the rope had been cut by Lewis because he wanted to release the boat. And that was the death. That's that spelled the death of the ship. So here they had the rope from the shore from the lifesavers. They had it out there. And he says, cut the rope for two reasons. He wants the boat to release and go back out to sea. And the other, he doesn't want any of the people on board to escape. He needs them. He needs them to sail the boat uh, once it uh, put it in operation, and he needs them to, to finish the job. This guy was a, very much like a pirate. He possibly was a murderer when it came to this. He was told by all the locals, don't into, do this. Was he, he heading into New York or back to England? No, he was going to New York to finish uh, the trip to New York. And salvage it. He, he, was, uh, he now had the ship. He, as a salvager, he was in control. So, so all these people were paid with the Shinnecocks paid as well, I presume. I, I'm going to tell you something. This is one of the questions I've looked into. I don't think anybody was paid. And I'll tell you why. You could insure the goods. You could insure the ships. What wasn't insured were human beings. Human beings were insured. They, they were dispensable. You die, get another one. And, uh, but, you know, it, it's amazing when you think about it. There were no, uh, you know, lawyer, there were no lawsuits on this thing. These guys were dead. It's over. What's next? But what was insured were the goods and they were sold in New York City. And, and the rest of them were found. A guy named O'Connell uh, scooped up the rest like a month after the uh, tragedy. And uh, he sold them in uh, New York City also. Uh, How long did it take uh, for this? catastrophe to develop as these people met the storm and the boat was not from the 12th from the 12th to the 30th so the 12th is the initial uh, uh landing on the sandbar being captured by the sandbar and then the um the the night of the 30th uh is the night when the tragedy takes place and uh all 28 people there were four survivors uh, an incredible character named uh, Morley. He was the first mate. He was ingenious. He built like a, a makeshift raft. And uh, two other, uh, Morley, the first mate, the ship's carpenter, and then one of the engineers, salvagers from New York. Uh, he organized them to do the right stuff. And they were the only ones washed ashore. And they were found by Gurdon Ludlow. So if you eat Maycox cheese... Uh, that's made by the Ludlow family out here. That's their great great grandfather, uh, who took these guys in from uh, and saved their lives along with the other uh, lifesavers. Lifesavers were amazing. So, so had the ship sunk or stayed afloat uh, through those two weeks? It was afloat on the sandbar, stranded. When it was broken in half, it went down on both sides of the sandbar. You could still see 
uh, part of it, uh, part of the hull sticking up with uh, part of one of the ship's mast. But uh, by the time the year was finished, it basically had disappeared uh, from storm after storm after storm. Um, so we so, were working right up until the last day, or what were they? Well, they, they, they were working. Yes, they were working up to twelve hours before the ship, shipment. and then they realized it's too late. I mean, it's, it, it's they, they got to stay on the ship. And as I said, uh, Lewis was told by everybody, let these men off the ship. You get off the ship. This is not safe. This is Long Island. The guys who knew the neighborhood, he didn't listen to. So he was as sharp as he was, as cunning as he thought he was, um, and with world experience. He had world experience from, uh, the, from uh, up in the polar regions, down to here. He knew how to save. He didn't understand the sandbars of uh, Long Island. And so this last night was uh, horrible. The song he was singing, the Shinnecocks, I think, were the ringleaders in keeping everybody calm. You have guys shouting for their mothers, you know, shouting for God to forgive them. They could hear this on shore. And the song they sang was uh, Jesus, the uh, uh, father of my soul. Uh, they sing. So here they are on shore in the middle of a storm. There's sleet flying in your face. You can't fire the guns anymore, the mortars that would uh, send a, a ball up. They tried it and they got shots off, but it is wet. It is snowy. It is freezing. And the shot here, in the rope, is that what they're doing? Yeah. They were shooting the smaller line. You shoot the, you know, the small line with the ball. And then you, like a clothesline, you pull a bigger line. And this is what had been cut by Lewis. Remember, he cut that uh, 24 hours before that. So here now they're trying to do it again. And the lifesavers did everything possible. It was impossible to go in the water. It was just a swirling death trap. Um, and, they, and you're 300 yards. So these 25 local people who is, you know, the head of the district, head of the uh, all lifesavers, uh, the Halseys, uh, people from town, other whaling captains. This is three o'clock in the morning. And they're watching this. I mean, they, this is before television yeah. and theater. This is live. This is this is live. And they're watching it right. uh, take place. And they just knew it was a tragedy. And the, listening to the Shinnecocks and everyone on board singing this hymn and yelling and they're watching it. And everybody is crying. They're crying on the ship. They're crying on the beach. These are all men. This was an all male thing for, you know, the, the, at this time. And it was like uh, watching a death take place. You know, there's nothing on TV you could put on that would have what these guys were watching. And they knew it was taking place. They were watching it take place and they were helpless and they could talk to these men or yell at or yell uh, across to them. It's an amazing dramatic uh, story. It's operatic. They, I mean, it's a really opera uh, inside it. I, I'm working on a play on it. And that's the reason I gathered all this information to write a play. Is it where the bodies washed ashore? Excuse where me? The bodies ashore. Yes. All bodies, all 28 over a period of uh, two weeks were recovered, some out to Montauk. It was running so fast east, the water was running so fast east, that the four guys who survived jumping off the ship, spending about less than eight minutes in the water, were found a mile away from the ship. So in six to eight minutes, their raft was taken a mile. That should give us just an idea how fast the, uh, the pole was, uh, that was going on there. The again, it was, the, all the ship, what that raft survived those four people. They were incredible. This is Morley. How they were survived, and they rushed them into the life saving house. They have a fire going, they're giving them the brandy, they're putting packs on them. The taking they had to rip off their clothes, which are icy, they had to wrap them in um, uh, their arms. And one they was they had to carry him in, uh, they thought he was dead. And he survived. All four survived. And one uh, who lived on Staten Island, I've been trying to track a family down for him to see if there were ever stories they heard. And then the uh, other uh, uh, three, he was a salvager. And the other three were from the, the British, from the ship. All the uh, uh, Shinnecock natives died, all 10. They were buried at the reservation uh, in, in two different ceremonies, one with the five being buried. And when they found the other five, 
they brought them together and it's it's amazing how when they buried him you know it was facing west which is a traditional native shinnecock uh thing people who gathered there were lifesavers townspeople uh the uh the montaukett came uh indians it was in you only had 175 shinnecock indians 175 now you have okay. 10 breadwinners who are fathers brothers and sons dying at the same time so the death of the the how the how the tribe has survived under the with this historical happening it's just amazing and don't remember and uh, don't forget the pastime of all the neighbors out here since the 16th it was how long are the Shinnecock's going to last you know that was like um how many are left now well yeah oh really oh you got that oh we got some more land to buy uh I mean you had this going on and but the Shinnecock's it was tenacious and how they were buried and the way it was done and the gathering of the community was incredible uh most of the churches out here donated you know money donated clothing however it was never enough after a while the women of the tribe were called the uh, Shinnecock widow woman and because everyone expected the tribe to disappear uh and uh it, it just wasn't enough what it, it, they they had money and goods Teddy Roosevelt through um one of the collecting groups actually it was his father it was Teddy Roosevelt's father donated $214, uh, which was a lot of money in those days. But yeah. money came in through all the communities here from New London. New York State Legislature gave $500, but it wasn't enough to really help the tribe gather themselves for a future life. It was good for a year and uh, or two, and that was it. So here they are, you have that. Now, the British sailors, who were a mixed group themselves were all buried plus the Irish stowaway 13 were buried in East Hampton you've written about this Dan uh, uh years ago and um but they were buried there one of them was a name Alan Notter he was an apprentice his uncles came over and they built a little monument there so if you look for the John Milton where it's buried very near the library in that little island in East Hampton yep. right next to it is where these 13 men and I call 12 British sailors plus the Irish stowaway um, uh, are all buried. Uh, and one monument to Alan Nada. They were wooden, uh, I guess, wooden tombstones, uh, wooden, uh, wooden markers that all disappeared with their names on it. Well, how, how, uh, so you'll be speaking at the Southampton Historical Society. A lecture is going to be on June 15th at five o'clock, and everyone's welcome. To come and you told me that there is going to be music and song accompanying your yes. lecture. Yes. Uh, who's, uh, John John Ludlow, uh, whose great grandfather was one of the life savers, is a great jazz musician. He's playing. I I would be singing sea shanties and songs of the time as the lecture goes on. Um, and uh, that's we we're doing. It, it's a little bit more of a performance piece rather than one of those dry lectures. So we've created something that we think is entertaining, even for people uh, who said, Rex, I'm not really interested in Rex, but we think we can make it a, an entertaining way to understand something that had a great impact on our community out here, not just Bridgehampton, but Southampton, all the Hamptons here. What, what happened to the, uh, the 10 Shinnecock natives was one how of the greatest tragedies. Briefly, how did you uh, get interested in uh in uh, learning all of this about this particular tragedy well you know i'm i'm actually a bartender a restaurateur from new york city and i but i've been out here for 40 50 years this has been my uh escape my dichotomy i call it because i had a bar called coogan's uh in washington heights probably one of the highest homicide rates so i would go from homicide and then i would come out to uh, the pastoral life here it was like two personalities i had but I'm standing on the beach one day where my children swim, Ocean Road, and a guy with a dog uh, comes up and he goes, too bad about what happened. And I said, what do you mean too bad about what happened? He says, well, you know, the people died right off. I go, what? So I'm thinking he's talking about yesterday. And I'm saying, what, what, what happened? And then he just walked away. And now I'm trying to find out, you know, so I went to the library to, to look at the newspaper. And I said, do you know anything about anybody dying uh, on the beach? And then for some reason, someone says, you know, 
there was a tragedy out there once. And they opened the door for me. And that's the day I got on board the Circassian. And then six years later, I finally had finished uh, the, the writing this little piece I've done on it, using people like Dan's papers and uh, the Times and uh, talking to people in Galway in Ireland and in Belfast. I've talked to people in Hull, the mayor of Hull. You know, the ship also was a, a blockade runner. Uh, it was captured by the Americans as a blockade runner. And the the poor guy who owned it had been a decent guy, Englishman, but he made a, a, a false, a false and bow, uh, uh, pack with the devil and uh, tried to send stuff to the South. And he was the mayor of Hull and he lost everything. It was like a Charles Dickens he was, thing. He lost everything in his life. And he was, you know. This is during the Civil War, right? Yeah. That's right. It was during the Civil War. It was captured in 1863, uh, uh, and it, it had a very good record as an American ship. Uh, it, it basically it brought dead, wounded supplies down and the dead and wounded back. Uh, it, it captured two uh, Confederate ships. Uh, it, like, its history was amazing. It was captured off Cuba, and when the the uh, the Civil War, uh, the captain of the American ship goes, uh, you know, Paul Hull. And the guy goes, I, I really don't have time. I'm in a hurry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this was typical. This is like Mighty Python. But the whole conversation yeah. and the name of the American captain is Captain English. So Captain That's... English is asking the English ship uh, of this uh, captain. Uh, to, to and the guy goes, I'm, I'm just in a hurry. But they capture the ship. And it's funny. They it, Again, it had engines on it. And the the they were called the Black Gang. If you worked in the engine room in those days, the 1870s, you were part of the Black Gang. You put the coal in, you got it going. You but you know you, you looked, uh, you were just colored with soot. And uh, they ref the British refused uh, to start the engines and and to use them. So the guy told them told them back to um, Key West, Florida. And it's a funny story because here's a guy. You know, I'm sure someone said, should we shoot them? And he goes, nah, we'll just tow him back. What the heck? Because it was a prize. It was one of the biggest prizes during the American Civil War. As I say, the Circassian story never stops. It yeah. is captured. Then it's sued in Supreme Court. It goes to Supreme Court years later from this uh, the mayor of Hull, who had owned the ship. And it loses in a major case in the Supreme Court that Lincoln wanted to know about it, uh, you know, uh, all the time. So right at the end of the war, it loses the case. So it's this. There's a serial here. It's uh, like I said. I, I hope you read. You get a little time to read some of the research. But there's so many stories to the Circassian. Well, well, with this will be uh, something to hear and see, and go go be there. And your manuscript is called "The Ocean Road." You told mm -hmm. me, and uh, uh, I want to thank you for being on the podcast. And uh, I wish you the best of. Uh, learning more about it uh, and telling more people about it. It's a seminal moment in the Shinnecox history. And I think everyone appreciates that you are uh, have become so knowledgeable about this and uh, what you can tell about it. So thanks again. Uh, I appreciate this, Dan. And again, thanks for, you know, the writing you've done on, on the story itself uh, inspired me to uh, go to the bigger story and to find out where the truth was. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.